Hello and welcome to another edition of the 66 to 87 podcast. I am Tom Reed, joined as always by Dave Molinari. And a little bit later, we will be joined by the Buffalo News' Mike Harrington. Uh, Sabres are on the schedule here pretty soon. And of course, big news in the NHL in the past week or so, the Jack Eichel trade. Mike Harrington, always entertaining, always opinionated. Uh, he'll deliver it again today. Uh, and a person who also delivered in the shootout, Dave, Tristan Jari on Thursday night, finally uh, breaks the shootout hoodoo that had s- suddenly and mysteriously <laughs> fallen over him in the first couple games of this season. Uh, he finally gets a win in the shootout. Uh, the, the Penguins get a, a nice win over uh, the, the Florida Panthers, who are a really nice team. Uh, but, Dave, I want to right now just focus on Tristan Jari, this crazy season that he's having in which I think he's playing pretty well, but right now a lot of the Penguin fans, including my wife, are losing their rag because the guy can't stop a buck in the shootout. Tell me what's what's going on with him uh, with, the, with the season and with the, the shootout problems. Well, he uh, he has been very good in in the games. Uh, you know, when, when they don't go past the sixty five minute mark, <laughs> uh, you know, he's been really good in regulation and overtime, and has uh, frankly uh, often been responsible for the Penguins being in a position to get a point out of a game. Uh, but. Before Thursday night, he had just been awful in in the shootouts. He had only stopped three of ten shots, which you would expect at least three of ten shooters to just miss the net. Um, yep. I mean, it it was remarkable how how he struggled, and and I think as, as with so many things in this game and, and others, um, you know, it it. Uh, you know, a lot of it, it is contested between your ears. Yep. And Absolutely. I think, I think this had turned into a, uh, a mental issue with him. And, you know, it, it's quite possible that, that one solid performance a- against some pretty good shooters like he had uh, against the Panthers can get him going in the right direction. Just like having a, a goal bounce in off of a you know a good goal scorer's hind end or a left foot or whatever can all of a sudden make his scoring touch return. Yeah, and you could see. I mean, every every uh, end of game uh, win like that where you know it just ends suddenly is always going to be have a nice celebration for a team. But you could tell in the you know the, the camera was zoomed in there on Jari and how much just I think his teammates knew probably how big that was to kind of get that monkey off his back to start this season. Um, you know, he has, as you mentioned, he has been so important in them getting points in, in this season where, where, where Sidney Crosby is what played one game. Is that right? Am I right? On yes, that? One, yes. One game. And, and, and Malkin has not played at all. Other guys have been in and out of the lineup. Uh, Dave, I, I just, I, I feel this guy is in some ways is in a no win situation because a lot of people don't want to judge him until the playoffs, but they've got to get there. But I tell you what, they would be carving him if he wasn't playing well. Right. Yeah. Now. And uh, I think the Penguins would already be jockeying for position in the draft lottery yep. if uh, he wasn't playing as well as he has been during regulations and overtimes. Uh, yeah. You know, he's. I think met or exceeded all reasonable expectations outside of overtimes, you know, or through, the first, through yeah, the first, yeah, uh, yeah, through the first dozen games uh, yeah. of the season. Uh, he certainly is, it has goaltending has not been their biggest problem to this point. No, it has not. And I, it, it, again, I think it was good, to, uh, good, it was one of those things good to see. And like you said, maybe it just takes one to kind of, get him out of that funk. It was funny to see Hornquist. I thought Hornquist was just going to run him over <laughs> because he came that in. That would be so uncharacteristic. Right. He came in at like 150 miles an hour. He didn't make a move. He just kind of like just slammed the puck against him. And that was almost like a give me. Uh, and why, why isn't Brian, Brian Rust is now four for four in shootouts. Obviously he's again, you're missing some star power here, but 
Uh, that, was a, that was a beautiful goal. I, again, I don't want to focus too much on the game itself, uh, but Dave, I want to <laughs> dovetail off something, and this is, may just be two cranky old men. Uh, I think the only person who has more of a trouble with shootouts than Chris and Jari is me. I am I'm just sick of them. I, I'm sick of shootouts. I think with the, the, the format that the NHL has now, with the three-on-three, three, if you want to bump it up two minutes to seven minutes, and if you can't score, no one deserves to win. I, I don't know. Where, where are you now with, with this as well? So we're going to have a long and ugly debate here about which one of us hates the shootout more. <laughs> uh, um, I have and never have had any use for the shootout. I think it's a ridiculously artificial way to, to settle a game. Um, I'm also not a fan of three on three overtime. Okay. Uh, I, I think, I think it's entertaining. You know, there's no question about that. that you know, there's invariably a lot of good chances at, at both ends of the ice, but it, you know, you're forcing, uh, you know, a victory for one team. You know, I, I think that if you, if you play 60 minutes and don't have a winner, then each team gets a point for a tie and, you know, now you, you move on to the next game. I don't think there's anything wrong with a tie. You know, so, uh, you know I one of the most that. famous games in hockey history was a tie. Absolutely. Uh, the one between the Canadians and the Soviets. Uh, you know, it's, it's you know, someone at the league level decided long ago, though, that it's imperative that every game have a winner, no matter what it takes to uh, squeeze one out. I think it is that also it seems to be the American way, so to speak. Fans hate the idea. Every time we tweet this out, just just end it in a tie. I love I love when NFL games ended ties. It, it makes my week when an NFL game ends in a tie. It rarely happens, but. Uh, I am all for going back to to ties. Now, again, I don't mind the three-on-three three format as much because I think that was brought in. Now, I can't. I'm, the the years are kind of going by on me and how many years we've had the three-on-three. Three. But the three-on-three three was was kind of introduced to kind of get away from shootouts, right? That was they, that was the hope that that they could solve it at least with some kind of team play instead of having the the skills competition. Yeah, I mean, but a three on three that doesn't happen organically in the in the course of a game, you know, it, it again it's artificial. That's it, it, just not three on three is not something that occurs very often in hockey nature. Um. I, I just don't think I, I don't see the need to uh, revert to it to uh, to determine an outcome. Two old men yelling, "Get off my lawn, kids!" With your shootout, or get uh, off my ice after sixty minutes. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm okay with overtime, and I, again, I'm okay with the three on three. But I but I your point is taken. I, I do understand that. Uh, when we come back, we're going to discuss. Uh, another penguin who's playing that really well um, in, in Chris Letang. Then we're also going to look around the league here after a dozen or so games and uh, just get our gets a sense of Dave's uh, some maybe early surprises or, or things that either both positive and negative. Uh, so stick with us here on the 66 to 87 podcast on DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast again. Seven podcast. Uh, we, we, we'll be joined next segment, as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, by Mike Harrington, the always entertaining Mike Harrington. And uh, if, if you're listening to this on Saturday, Dave, I hope there's a game. I mean, the Ottawa Senators, who uh, uh, you'll be uh, on hand to cover, are just absolutely ravaged with COVID right now. That they, they may have to call like Daniel Alfredson and Wayne Redden out of retirement to play this game. 
Well, and they'd better be in the country or they might have difficulty getting in given Canada's border regulations. Um, yeah, it's remarkable. There, there were, I believe, in the Senators' most recent game on Thursday night, they had nine players and a coach who were in the COVID protocol. Um, and, you know, the, the cumulative experience of their lineup that night, I think, was about, you know, 57 man games in the NHL. I mean, just ridiculous. And um, I know the, the NHL is really reluctant to postpone slash reschedule games this season because, you know, there's virtually no NHL hockey in the month of February because of the Olympics. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they really don't want to have to shuffle s- schedules to, uh, to fit in games that, that weren't played because of COVID. But I mean, at some point just for, you know, to keep it reasonable from a competitive standpoint, you know, you might want to give the senators a chance to, you know, get reasonably healthy to say nothing of trying to uh, limit the, the danger of a Senator passing something along to another team and, you know, getting a brush fire of COVID started there. Well, the Penguins certainly don't need any more COVID cases. Uh, they, and they're probably, they're not going to have any sympathy for the senators. Uh, one player who has to, dealt with with the virus issues this season and yet just is marching on like he's 24 years old it's chris letang dave i mean this guy is is what like 34 years old uh leads uh that leads the entire national hockey league in time on ice now that not necessarily uh, letang has always kind of been up there because you know he's a he plays a lot of minutes he always has but at his age i've been really impressed uh, with how well he has started this season. Um, this I don't believe this counts Thursday night's game, but a goal, uh, six assists, seven points, and Thursday night's game, he had a beautiful pass uh, to set up uh, the game's first game goal by Teddy Bluger. I think he's just been terrific. Uh, he has. Um, and it's not so much the things that he's doing well, because there are many things that he's always done well. It's that he really seems to have exercised some of the bad decisions and sloppy executions out of his game. Um, He's really playing much more controlled, uh, much smarter, um, and he has been absolutely outstanding. And, you know, for... (laughs) It wasn't that long ago that he was in the COVID protocol, uh, but you would never know it from his ice time. I think against uh, against the Panthers the other night, he played about 28 and a half minutes, which, I mean, it is just ridiculous. Yeah, no, they had an injury in that game, but yes, but he yeah. probably would have played that anyway. Yeah, and I mean, they're, they're trying to cut down on some of his really most demanding minutes by by not using him as much on, on the penalty kill and things like that uh, as they have in the past. But um, you know, he's, st- it, he's still out there almost constantly and, uh, you know, and doing, good, doing good things most of the time, if not yeah, and, pretty much all of the time this season. Right. And not a big guy. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, some of these, you look at some, uh, uh, the, some of the other guys in the league that are, that are up there year after year, uh, are usually bigger players that 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 can play a physical game, where Latang's Latang's game has always been just his mobility and build, uh, just uh, ability to get up the ice and create and get back into plays to help out, and his fitness level uh, must be just through the roof. Uh, he must be an incredibly well conditioned athlete. Yeah, and I, I mean anybody who questioned that, and I think people who have watched him for you know throughout his career probably don't. But the way he came back after you know missing ten days uh, because of COVID, and you know just took on his usual workload, his usual heavy, you know at at this point in time, 
uh, unrivaled workload in, in the league uh, really tells you all you need to know ab- about what a, a well-conditioned athlete he is. Now, now help me out here, Dave. Would he – obviously, I don't think they've had the team selected yet, but would he be a candidate uh, for Team Canada, or do you think that they would have enough – players because what i'm getting at is i i think he could he could do with the rest in february uh given the, the what looks like is going to be an incredible amount of work this season yeah um i, I would have guessed going into the season that he would have been on the periphery of, right. of those discussions i have to think he's you know climbed up the uh yeah the Canadian depth chart a little bit with, with the way he is, has played so far this season. Um, you know, it's Canada has, has no shortage of quality defensemen to pick from, but I can't believe that uh, there are that many who, who are playing better than, than Chris Letang is right now. And yes, I'm sure the Penguins would prefer <laughs> that he, he not go just as they would prefer that, that Crosby and Malkin not go to the Olympics, but you know, it's good luck with that one. It's yeah. It's pretty much a given that they will be there. And I don't think the Penguins can assume anymore that, uh, that Chris Letang won't be there. Yeah. I I, I still think it, I still think it's less than 50, 50, but he's making it awfully tough on Canada's decision makers. Yeah, I agree. Um, All right. We're about a a dozen games, uh, give or take one or two into the season. And, and I want to get your thoughts on, on uh, around the league. We, we talked mostly about the Penguins here, of course. Uh, but w- when you look around the league, what has jumped out, what teams maybe have jumped out either for the good or for the bad in, in the, these first dozen games, I'll, I'll let you uh, give me your thoughts on the, on, on, on your picks first. Well, uh, the team that has jumped out as me out at me as much as it's can and, makes me jump out of my seat every time it's fired is uh, the, the Columbus. Yeah. Um, I believe they won seven of the first 10 games this yep. season. Um, you know, that that's a pretty nice start for any team, but for one that I don't even know that uh, management really thought was going to be a serious contender for a playoff spot, that's an exceptional start, and uh, I think a, a real credit to everybody in that organization. A team that it, it hasn't fared quite as well, but I think uh, has also been a bit of a surprise, is Detroit, which has been hovering at or slightly above 500. Uh, the Red Wings are another team that, that's in a major rebuild, and uh, I, I you know, don't think anybody expected them to be a factor in anything but the draft lottery again this year. But, you know, the Red Wings have gotten off to a pretty good start. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. yeah. No, uh, go ahead. I'll, uh, I'll give you my, my thoughts on, on, and I would agree with you. you. You stole my thunder here being in Columbus. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, yeah. The, Columbus has been really good. You know, no Seth Jones. Uh, they have brought uh, uh, Voracek back and he's played well. But they're without line A right now, so uh, they've done a nice job. The other team that has continued, and I, w- I wondered if, 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 if this team would uh, continue to play well after the breakout season they kind of had last year, was the Wild. And we've seen the Wild already this year in Pittsburgh. Uh, kind of an impressive group, 9-3 and three, uh, through their first 12 games. I've, I've been very impressed with them. Uh, and then you, you look out in that Pacific Division, Dave, uh, they're starting, they've started to level off just a bit, but boy, Calgary. And then you and I have talked about off the, off the, uh, off air about Daryl Sutter. And this, this team just reminds me a little of, of his LA Kings teams. They're big, they forecheck and, uh, there you are in your face. Uh, they're, they and, but not a way that's like, Oh my God, this is so painful to watch. Like Dallas is Calgary's a fun team to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was very impressed with uh, with the game they played in Pittsburgh, and you know, particularly on an individual basis, uh, Jacob Markstrom in, in that game was outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. He's obviously not somebody we see 
you know, in Pittsburgh all that often because he's played in Vancouver and now with the Flames. But he was very impressive, uh, the game at PPG Paints Arena. Yeah. On, on, conversely, while we're out west, there are a couple of clubs that I think uh, more was expected of them, and they might certainly still perform the expectations over the course of the season. But Colorado bobbing along around 500, I don't think any of us anticipated. And I also thought that uh, Vegas was capable of, of a lot better than it has shown so far. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, obviously, Vegas has made the big trade, and we're going to talk a little bit uh, with Mike Harrington uh, about that. So they, they've they've lost Tuck recently. But, yeah, those are two teams I would have to think. I would be shocked in the end if, 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 if those two teams were – fighting for a playoff spot late in the season. Um, you know, I mean, my goodness, the Arizona, the Arizona Coyotes, huh. uh, that, that, that situation there is, you know, it's, it's almost in an, I don't want to say an embarrassment for the league, but they're just kind of, they're dead men walking. We don't know where the franchise is going to go. Dave, they're, 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 they're minus 33 somehow in goal differential. Uh, in 13 games, which is, that's a pretty impressive number from an ugly standpoint. Uh, yeah, and they, I mean, they did manage to win one of their first 11 games. So, you know, let's not be too harsh on them. <laughs> you know, perhaps firing Rick Tockett after last season or not renewing his contract. Maybe that wasn't the answer after all. No. Um, that, I mean, that was just such a ridiculous decision on many levels. Probably ultimately a good one for Tockett because I think he'll, you know, end up with a, you know, a job that, uh, you know, is a lot uh, where, where the chances for success are a lot greater than, than they will be with a dysfunctional operation like, like Arizona. Yeah, at least they probably know the team's going to stay in that arena for a while. When you when the arena's saying you got to go, <laughs> probably, yeah. probably not a good sign. One team that's, that's down in the standings but I think has an excuse is Montreal, of course, Carey Price just starting to work his way back into playing, but they have, they have really had a rough start you know, again, the team uh, kind of a playoff darling last year that got all the way to the final, uh, but they're off to a difficult, a difficult start. Dave, I would think, uh, you know, I don't think any surprise with Carolina, right? This is kind of what we expected in many ways. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know that Florida's success is all that much of a surprise. I mean, maybe they're, they're doing slightly better than I expected, despite uh, hitting a bit of a skid recently. But, you know, the, the, like Carolina, that's a team with, you know, some really good young talent. Um, so, yeah, those, those are two clubs that I, I think we'll be hearing from all season. Real quickly, before we go to break, I, I want to get your thoughts on, I, I, I know you watched Thursday night's game. Uh, it, it was nice to see the ovation, and, and you wouldn't have sp- expected anything otherwise, uh, but for, for Patrick Hornquist, and, and just so instrumental in those two teams, and really seems to have found a, a, a second or third wind, uh, uh, the way that he plays, and, and I, I had, didn't have a problem with a deal at the time, uh, given that the, 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 the Penguins had to start getting younger at some point, and you, it certainly wasn't going to come at the expense of Malkin or Crosby or Latang. Uh, but, boy, he's played well for Florida. He's, he's been a nice addition, and it was nice to see that, that the team honored him. They did it right. It was a nice ceremony, and the fans uh, really responded. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I thought he had a really strong season last year. Mm-hmm. This year – you know, he only has, uh, through Thursday night's game, only one goal. Um, he still, you know, creates havoc in front of the net like like few guys can. But, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, all the hard miles on him might finally be starting to show and that he might ultimately prove to be the uh, embodiment of the uh, – the adage that it's better to trade a guy one year too early than one year too late. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm certainly not prepared to predict that uh, Hornquist has outlived 
uh, his usefulness or, or can't be productive anymore. But, you know, when, when, when you play the way he does and you've done it for so long, it just has to take a toll on you. Absolutely. And, you know, and I, I think it, that might finally be catching up with him a bit. Thomas Holmstrom, he's closest the closest thing I've seen to Thomas Holmstrom uh, in the league since uh, Holmstrom uh, hung it up years ago. It seems like decades ago now with that with that, those Red Wing teams. Swedes um, are such nice people too. Why? You know, why, <laughs> why are they yeah, Ulf, so absolutely annoying on the ice? Wolf Samuelson is a yeah. classic example. All right, when we come back, we will be joined by, by Mike uh, uh, Mike Harrington, and please stick st- stick with us because. Harrington is 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 good as always. Uh, we love having him on the show. And again, the, the Penguins will be playing the uh, new look uh, Buffalo Sabers here in the next uh, couple days. Uh, stick with us here on the six to six to eight seven podcast. Podcast, and as promised, joined by the great Mike Harrington from the Buffalo News. Uh, the, the Penguins will be playing the Sabres here coming up, and we always love to catch up with Mike. He's always got some good opinions, and right now he's got a lot to talk about. Uh, I, I, Mike, I will say I was disappointed that the Sabres got rid of one of their Rasmuses because I thought any, organ, any organization that has three Rasmuses in it <laughs> is, is really going in the right direction. And now they're down to two. Well, we we thought about this and we were arguing amongst ourselves. Was it a triple Rasmuses or was it a triple Rasmus? <laughs> you know, we didn't know. But yeah, R- Ristolainen is gone now. They still have Dalian and Asplin. And Ristolainen, by the way, guys, got off to a terrible start in Philly. And everybody in Buffalo is kind of like, ha, ha, ha. Ristolainen has been a lot better lately. Philly's a pretty good fit for him. I- I'd like to see how it's going to keep going there for him. I did like that player. All right, but the big news, of course, finally, much to the sh- much to the delight of everyone who's had to write about this saga, especially our Mike Harrington, the Jack Ankle trade has been made off to Vegas. Uh, just uh, Mike, we, this is, it's been the news is a week old now, but you know we, we have you on here. You know, how did the fan base react to the trade, and what are your initial thoughts on the return the Sabers got? Well, most importantly, first of all, when you going in the department of it's all about me you haven't lived guys until you've been looking <laughs> up at 4 45 pacific time in the morning in a hotel in seattle saying the eichel trade just went down so that made it unusual that was a welcome to seattle moment um you know what this is not the ryan o'reilly trade and that was something everyone was kind of comparing it to would it be a disastrous return And you look at the return, I think the fan base, of course, knew this trade was coming, and it was just a question of which team is going to pull the trigger on Jack Eichel and what the return was going to be. And you study the return here, and the fan base understands this club is really building up, and you get a legitimate top six forward in Alex Tuck. You get a legitimate prospect in Peyton Krebs. You get another number one draft pick, even though it's top ten protected. The Vegas isn't going to be in the lottery, I don't think. And they got a, a you know another pick in 2023. That's a pretty good return for a guy who could be a star player again, but is uncertain due to the me- due to the medical situation. And the other you know hidden moment for people who aren't in Buffalo who don't know about this is Alex Tuck, terrific player, 20 goal scorer, is from outside of Syracuse, New York. He grew up as a massive fan of the Buffalo Sabers. That was his dream team. He wears number 89 because of Alexander McGilney, and he lived a house or two down the street from former Sabres center Tim Conley, who would join the kids on the street in street hockey games. So not only do you get a guy who's a good player, but at a time when the Buffalo Sabres probably have a recruiting issue in the NHL world, especially in free agency, you get a guy whose dream was be to play for the Buffalo Sabres. So that's pretty good. Uh just going along, staying with the Eichel thing for a minute, for the organization, maybe for the fan base, even even for you guys. Even for the media. Even for the media. Just the <laughs> having the weight taken off 
this organization by getting this behind them? Is it just a, a just a breath of fresh air and a chance to finally kind of move on instead of having these headlines all the time and all the focus on the organization? At least it's behind them now. Well, let's look at me again for a second here, guys. Not that it's about me. <laughs> Every time over the summer and all through camp, anytime you wrote something about Jack Eichel, it just would explode. You know, we talk sure. about analytics and hockey. We have analytics in the journalism world. You couldn't write enough about Jack Eichel and the situation and the ongoing saga and drama. So from that standpoint, I'm a little sad. But from the standpoint of moving forward, the entire organization, the fan base, yes, the media, there is a hockey season to cover here. Um it needed to happen, and I think we were reaching the breaking point of when it was really going to be a distraction for this club because really no one talked about it much after the first couple of days of training camp and the season got going and they played a bunch of games. But as the rumors grew when we were in Seattle last week on trade day, the players admitted they were checking their phones. It was all they were seeing on their phones as the rumors really started to heighten up. And I think Kevin Adams and the Pagulas knew it was time, and I think they also knew – Jack Eichel might be planning a grievance. And they also knew Jack Eichel was probably going on a media tour. Some of these media interviews you've seen were not planned in the wake of the trade. They were already happening. And they would have had a much more darker tone to them had Jack Eichel still been a member of the Buffalo Sabres. So I think a lot of these things really pushed that trade that day. And we knew it was coming, too, because Kevin Adams was not on the road trip. He was expected oh. to join join the Sabres in San Jose and then go to Seattle to get a look at Climate Pledge Arena. My antenna was surely up as you were playing the game of where's the GM. The fact he wasn't there told me it was about to go down. Yeah. Uh, Mike, you were an early champion, if I remember, at least on Twitter, where, where everything is accurate, uh, of, of Don Granado uh, last year. Yep. <laughs> Pushed into a really difficult position. Thought he did a pretty nice job. What have you seen so far this season that you think it was the right call? Well, I wrote that in April when the season was still going on, that this is the right coach for this team. I didn't think you needed to bring in a Boudreaux, a Tortorella, a Gallant type. I think you needed to bring in a development coach. And I was wondering how much we were seeing the new coach bump and how much we would really see in training camp. And let me tell you guys, we saw it right away in training camp with Don Granado that reaffirmed that I was correct in my opinion, the way he worked training camp, the way practice was harder. Forget about the games and how terrible the Buffalo Sabres were last season. They didn't practice anywhere near hard enough. We would watch other teams' morning skates, and it was just like a different league at the tempo that these teams were going at in their morning skates, let alone a practice. The Sabres practice much harder now. They practice much more efficiently, and they play much harder in the games. And it's a reflection of coaching. And the other thing Don Granado did was change mentality. He wants to be more entertaining. They need to be to sell tickets. But he also wants these players to stop worrying about making mistakes. Hockey is a mistake game. And too many of these players were stuck in their skates under Ralph Kruger, simply afraid to make a single mistake at all. And Granado says, if you're going to play that way, you're going to lose all your aggressiveness. You're not going to advance. You're going to have the wrong mentality. He needs them attacking. Guys are no longer afraid to make mistakes. And that's a huge transition from the psychological end of this team. Uh, Mike, I, I don't think anybody in Pittsburgh who's watched Victor Olofsson play, uh, is surprised that he's got off to a better than point per game start to the season. But uh, what do you make of him and uh, when can we expect to see him back? Yeah, I don't know, Davey. That's been the question. Victor Olson walked off the ice in the middle of practice in San Jose, you know, now 11 days ago, and we haven't seen him since. And they all have described it as a soft tissue injury. So I'm thinking it's a groin, an oblique, something like that. Um, the biggest thing he did at the start of this season was he became much more efficient on five and five. He had been too much of a power play specialist. And now he's a guy who's been going to the net more. He's been working harder on the four check and he's become a much better five on five player. And a guy who over an 82 game season could be a 25 to 30 goal guy. Now we don't know what he's going to be now, how impacted he's going to be by this injury when he gets back. They say he'll, when he's back, he'll be good to go. But yeah. It was a big start for him. He was certainly the leading guy. Casey Middlestat got hurt in game one. Olsen became the main guy. They've missed him quite a bit since he's been out. Uh, 
Uh, the goaltending for the Sabres, uh, Craig Anderson and Dustin Tokarski, what do you make of them? And, and do you think that's a, that's a tandem that, that can keep that team competitive? You know, so far it has. There hasn't been a single game that they have lost yet where you said, oh, the goalies killed them there. No, the goalies have saved their bacon a lot of the time. Um, the biggest factor I've worried about is injury, and Anderson's out now. He took a shot high, not a shot from a puck. I, he, you know, Players barreled into him in San Jose on a goal, and I, I think he's got some sort of head-neck concussion issue going on. But he's been great, you know, almost retired. He's in his 40s. Dustin Tokarski. You know, you guys know him from the Penguins minor league system. Got a little bit of a chance last year. He's been great. Um, you wouldn't have expected it. Um, these guys are probably playing over what they're going to play, but they're not going to drop off the map either because they, first of all, have played well, but there's a better system in place. Granado's not leaving guys out to dry. There's not these 10 odd man rushes a night and guys wide open in the middle there were under Ralph Kruger's system. And yeah, I think these goalies have been the big surprise of the season. Can they keep things going? They, they kind of got to hold the fort here, but I don't think they're going to suddenly drop to 870 or 880. I think they can keep that in that 905, 910, 915 range of save percentage, and that'll keep this team in things. Uh -huh. And I, I think it's safe to say that rock bottom has been hit by the franchise and is now in the rear view mirror. <clears throat> that the Sabres are on the rebound. But, you know, what has to happen for this to be a successful season for them? This is about development. To me, Dave, this is, you know, you, you make the analogy of a player signing a bridge contract for his first contract out of his entry-level deal. This is a bridge season for the Buffalo Sabres. I really think they're going to take a big jump next year. When you add in Owen Power, the number one overall pick, who's now at Michigan, when you add in on a full-time basis, Jack Quinn and J.J. Paterka, top draft picks of the last two years. Um, they have a lot of prospects coming. Matias Samuelson, the big defenseman, is in Rochester. I think you're really looking at a big jump right away. The goaltending to me is a big issue. They have three great prospect goalies. Can any of them really start to step forward next year is a huge question. But right now, this year, can they make the playoffs? I don't think they're a playoff team, but I, I think they're not near the bottom. I didn't pick them near the bottom. The whole world said oh, the Buffalo Sabres are the worst team ever. No, Arizona was clearly the worst team going into this season, and that's been played out. The Buffalo Sabres are looking at 23 to 27 overall this year. That's an improvement, and then you go from there. But, yeah, I think continue to develop. Develop these players. Develop guys in Rochester. Win in Rochester. Develop some guys in Buffalo like Dylan Cousins, who's in the NHL. Get Middlestat back. Have him have a good year. You know, get – Give me a 75-point season, for crying out loud, once in our lives, right? <laughs> you got to walk before you can run, but I really think they are looking at a big jump next year. And, Mike, I, I, I think it's you're a little harsh on the Coyotes. They did win one of their first 13 games. Jeez. I mean, they are just – they you know, they are mind-bogglingly bad. And some of the games have been close, I know. But it's just unbelievable to me. I tell you one thing. How about ESPN? They got to be loving. Oh, our ESPN Plus showcase this week, Arizona and Chicago. Oof. <laughs> Drop off of that one. I mean, I, I saw they, they changed up the Black Friday schedule. They got rid of St. Louis and Chicago for Rangers Boston. Can you imagine NBC ever dumping a Chicago game? NBC so, showed Chicago so much. They never would have considered dumping a Chicago mm -hmm. game. It's about time these networks are starting to, you know, think a little bit there's my you know my side angle for the day <laughs> it's beautiful you're a beautiful man it's uh always a pleasure to have this man on uh i hope i hope gabriel's gate is still open i hope everything's is. good up there the best one my favorite wings in buffalo and uh always a delight to talk to the great mike harrington and that's it uh for this week's edition of the 66 to 87 podcast for mike harrington Dave Molinari, this is Tom Reed. We'll talk to you next week on DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting. <laughs>